I just kind of assessed the situation and I said to myself, you have been saved. No matter what else happens at this point on, from this point forward, you have been saved, you're alive. Welcome back, everyone. Another cloudy, overcast day out there today. Temperatures struggling, but today we didn't we're going to continue to... to watch that heavy rain moving across the south. We are going to see... A warm, humid, and sunny day that has turned into a potentially stormy evening for some Here's in our area. Here's what we can expect for tonight. There is the potential for isolated tornadoes, especially off towards the south. That northern... I had just finished up uh, putting the job to bed, and I was in the car on my way home. I drove literally from normal weather into a terrible storm. Uh, it was like driving into a sheet of, of water and was in the car maybe 60 seconds before I ended up at the red light. I was in a new car that I had just gotten and there was a lot of debris being blown through the air and the last conscious thought I had was, gee, I hope nothing dents my car that uh, as the twisting winds are twisting down from that funnel cloud, there's a possibility now of a tornado on the ground northeast. There was a loud explosion. 911, what is your emergency? Yes, sir. I'm on Texas Street, and we are here at the First Methodist Church. At First Methodist Church? Yes, and in, the steeple has come off, and it completely crushed the car. Okay, let me let you talk to the police. Is anyone hurt? Uh, Ma'am, I'm sure they're dead. Somebody's in the in the car? Ma'am, I'm sure they're dead. We were coming back on the Common Street uh, when the call came in, and we happened to look up the hill and see the steeple and stuff laying there, and we didn't know what was going on, and the call came in over the radio. From the time it called in, I would say it took us about 30 to 40 seconds from where we were to, to get to on scene. I mean, we had just been through there uh, probably four minutes ago, and I'm thinking, man, I mean, look what four minutes has done, you know. As I looked to my left going down I-49, I actually saw the tornado, and approximately two minutes after that, uh, the dispatch come in that a steeple had fallen on a vehicle uh, downtown, and so I was so close, I went ahead and put myself on that run. Just the impact of that steeple hitting the car and the damage that it did to that vehicle, none of us thought there's any way that somebody could survive that. Initially pulled up, we saw the cops kind of waving us in and we've made enough runs to read the cops' body language. Well, he's probably didn't make it. I could not understand if I had been hit by another car. The car had just exploded. I, I couldn't understand what had happened. I opened my eyes and I was laying on my side curled up in a little ball and there was no automobile left. I could see uh, a severed finger and I could see that my hand was turned upside down on my wrist and I could see that it was in, in, not in a normal position. I could see a steering wheel that went down into my leg and I couldn't breathe. I just kind of assessed the situation and I said to myself, you have been saved. No matter what else happens at this point on, from this point forward, you have been saved, you're alive. Whatever it was that was pinning me down, I yelled at them, would they please come over and, and pull it off of me? Everybody's getting all their gear together, and they're going up there, and he's like, hey, y'all get me out of here. It doesn't just stun people that don't do this job for a living. It stuns people that do this job for a living and don't think somebody could have survived an incident like that. Did we kick it in another gear? I'd say we kicked it in probably 10th gear from first. I can't see very far without my glasses, so I didn't see much of anything. The, the image I have was a foggy, out-of-focus image of people running toward me at what looked like slow motion. It looked like an old spaghetti western. Their job was to get him out and my job was to help keep him alive until we could get him to the hospital. 
and we tried to get some uh, IV lines and stuff established on him, got him on oxygen, and uh, kind of doing ALS life-saving measures to try and help keep him alive if we had any problems, because well, we knew this was going to be a lengthy extrication. The craziest thing, how the car just peeled perfectly around him, and the steering wheel went perfectly between his legs through the seat. Some uh, wrecks we make, the extrications is kind of uh, cut and dry, start here, go here, but this was, you know, it was a mess. I distinctly remember somebody who was floating over my head. He would float from one side of my vision to the other and float from here and float from there. I could just see him floating. And he had on these big heavy boots and this big flappy jacket. And I remember thinking, how does he do that? I can remember being on scene, going back and forth, trying to cut him, but it was perfectly formed around him. You know, we were having to watch out for him you know, make, make sure we didn't cut him, but. You know, he, he's sitting in the seat with all this metal wrapped around him. We have to be mindful that we have thousands of pounds of pressure on our hydraulic tools that could be pushing parts of the car back in on him. I told him, I said, we're gonna tell you everything that's going on. I said, if we have to cover you up, we're gonna cover you up. You're gonna hear a saw running in a minute to get the, the metal above your head out of the way. It's the only way we can get it out. So we're gonna cover you up with a bunker coat and I said, I'll talk you through it. So the whole time he was under the bunker coat, I was talking to him. He was talking back to me, and his spirit stayed up the whole time. I could tell that people were doing a really serious job. Whatever it was that they do, they were very committed to taking care of me. I didn't know what was impending on him, if he possibly would have a lot of blood loss once we lifted that vehicle up off of him. And we had to manipulate his legs out and everything to keep from hurting him and bring him out the top, which is about the hardest way you could get somebody out of a vehicle. When I felt hands slipping under my arms and slipping under my knees, and they jacked the dash of the car up and they, they lifted me up. It was like I floated. And I had people on all sides of me floating me from this wreckage onto a stretcher. And I distinctly remember what that felt like, being freed of that. It took us, I believe, exactly 55 minutes to cut him out of the vehicle. And because of the time frame, you're always in fear of, you know, of him bleeding to death or anything like that. So that critical one hour was, was right there. When Michael arrived at our ER, um, the trauma team, of course, was there prior to him getting there because Biotel had warned us that he was coming. And I remember walking to the head of the bed, and I always tell this to my trauma patients because they're so scared. We're fixing to do a lot of things to you, and we'll explain as we go. And we started at that point to work on him. Uh, I was walking down the street in New Orleans, and I got a phone call from the LSU ER. I said, what's, what's wrong? What are his injuries? And she said, well, he, he does seem to have a lot of broken bones. So then it's starting to dawn on me, a lot of broken bones? And I said, what do you mean, a lot of broken bones? And she said, well, I think most of his extremities are broken. I called my son and I said, there's been an accident. The, the, a steeple fell on Michael's car and he said, oh my God, I'm watching that on TV, that was Michael? Behind me, the steeple that used to be at First Methodist Church in downtown Shreveport is now falling down onto the ground. The 25,000 pound steeple crushed his car. The car was no match for this giant steeple you see behind me. It fell off the church in one piece, trapping this man inside a mangled mess. A tornado blew the steeple off First Methodist Church in downtown Shreveport. It landed on top of a car. There was an urgency in the air. They did triage on me very quickly. They uh, put staples in my head immediately, uh, put IVs in me. And I remember sitting there taking in the sights and sounds of what was a horrific evening for everybody. My son prevailed upon a kind doctor in the ER to take my son's cell phone and hold it up to Michael's head while I was driving and I said, I love you and I'm coming, I'm on my way. I look back, I hear the firefighters' stories, I hear Michael's story and I think, what would I have done if I'd been there? It would have been horrible. 
but not being there, not being by his side to hold his hand, to say, it's gonna be okay, they're gonna get you out of here. Um, that was hard, that was hard. I felt like I should have been there. I walked in and my son was with him and there was blood everywhere and there were bloody sheets everywhere and it just, it, and he was on a backboard in a sea collar looking at the, at the ceiling and he had blood everywhere and it was just shocking. It was a horrifying sight. Something that didn't show up could happen and you know vital signs could start dipping and stuff like that so I mean everybody wants their you know spouse around when something like this is going on because you never know what can happen but um, after we talked to her and the doctors talked to her you know so I think she was more comforted and you know felt better to be at his side. When I saw his chart there was a concern about a fracture of the chest bone and some blood behind it and the heart is just sitting behind that bone. I sat down and I took a piece of paper and wrote down all his injuries and specifically kept on telling him that these are all systems involved and this is how we are going to handle. And that helped him a lot to understand. And also I went ahead and told him that which is the most concerning right now and which will be taken care of later. So this is how we interacted. The doctors and nurses, staff, everybody who worked with him, I mean everybody who worked with him were so kind, so caring. Um, they told us exactly what was going to happen every step of the way. and. It made me think, wow, they really do know how to take care of people here. If you have someone like Michael, who's an optimist, who has a great deal of faith, who can take whatever life throws at him and make it into something better, um, you're always gonna have a successful outcome. I, I could see the change in him. He was like, he was already driven, I would say that, but he would get more positive about it, that it is gonna get better, it's gonna get better, because he could see that every day we would fix the injury, then he could feel better about it. It took a while for him to get back to being himself, but gradually he got it. It's pretty remarkable to have a level one trauma center in a city this size. I mean, we are so lucky that if something happens to you, you have a team in the hospital ready to address any kind of trauma you might have right there. And, and that happened with Michael. He needed surgery. He needed a lot that happened immediately, and they were right there, and we are so blessed to have that. If I had to experience an event like this, then I was in the best hands, absolute best hands, to get me where I am today. It's an amazing feeling when they're up walking around, you know, when they've been shot or they've been stabbed, or like Michael, you know, is back up with his family at home, you know, and is living a long life. And he overcomes all his injuries and he does well and he feels positive, not only physically but also mentally. I think that's, that's it's very, very, very encouraging. When I see a patient, any patient, Mr. Williams included, who comes in with whatever type injury, and that person, he or she goes home, there isn't any amount of money in the world they can make up for that. A hero to me is somebody who does what he or she does every single day without question, but does it in a way that makes people's lives better. I have so much gratitude. I appreciate things that I never noticed before. All of that was given to me by these heroes. This is probably one of the fewer cases that you know, uh, runs that I've, I've made that somebody comes back and, and is so appreciative of it. Uh, you know, it, it's just a warm feeling all over. We believe God saved his life, but I also believe that God that day was wearing firefighters uniforms and medical uniforms, and they're the ones who saved his life. What I, I call an EMS system is from the field to the hospital and to surgery. I think everybody did a great job and I'm proud. I'm proud of our city. 
this incident that had happened with Mr. Williams was, uh, you know, and it, it, it changed a lot of people's lives. I thought for a long time, why Michael? Why was he, why did it have to be Michael sitting at that red light? But then I thought, why wasn't he pulled over half an inch to the right? Because if he had been, he'd be dead. Why was it that the firefighters were only 60 seconds away? Why was it that for 55 minutes, he was okay in that car? Why was it that the team was there in place at LSU to take care of him? You know, I can't answer why. I'm just grateful that they were. And I would just say thank you for saving my husband's life. The fact that they do what they do so well and got me out of that car the way they did, the way uh, the trauma center performs its duties. I know they do it every day for so many other people. This is their jobs, but they also did it for me. And they saved my life. They're not just friends, they're lifesavers.